Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this CERC training webinar. As part of FEMA's Community Engagement and Risk Communication Initiative, this webinar series hosted by Resilience Action Partners highlights CERC program elements as well as risk communication and mitigation topics that are critical to strengthening community reach efforts and mitigation action. Today's facilitated discussion is building community resilience with nature-based solutions. And we're actually gonna kick things off with that quick poll that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is not a pass or a fail. It's just an opportunity for us to kickstart our conversation. And you can choose more than one option here as well. So tell us, in relation to the case studies that are outlined in the new Nature-Based Solutions Guide, which success strategies do you relate to? Again, this poll is a requirement for the ASFPM Continuing Education Credit. So participation here is key if you'd like to receive that credit for today's webinar. And here's the thing I always forget, be sure to hit that submit button after you made your selection because that throws me off every time. So click, click your selection, you can click more than one and hit submit. And I'll give just a minute here for everybody to have time to respond. Um, Leah, do you want to keep do you want to keep going and introduce the panel? And for those who are just joining, um, I'll leave the poll open for up for a few more seconds. That sounds great. Yeah, we're seeing a pretty even distribution so far. So that's great. We do have a fantastic panel with us today. Our facilitator is Dr. Marissa Zuzulak. Marissa is serving as a physical scientist in FEMA's climate mm -hmm. division, leading in the coordination of nature-based solutions efforts and supporting efforts with other federal agencies. Taking part in today's discussion, we have two phenomenal partner organizations. Jay Wozniak is the Park Program Director for Trust for Public Lands Georgia office and is responsible for coordinating the community engagement, design, and construction of parks for the nonprofit organization. Rachel Keith is an Associate Professor of Medicine with the Division of Environmental Health and the Director of Human Subject Services with the Envirome Institute at the University of Louisville. Her research program combines her diverse skill set in basic sciences, nursing, community participatory research, and environmental health studies. And to kick us off today, we have Bradley Dean. Bradley is the Climate Communications and Partnerships Lead for FEMA Resilience. Before taking on this new role, he led the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, the RNPN, coordinating diverse resilience, climate adaptation, and natural hazard mitigation efforts. So with all that, I'll turn it over to Brad. Thanks, Leah. Um, awesome. I see that the polls like, yeah, really diverse, pretty fairly evenly split uh, across, across each one. I'm glad to see engaging the whole community is definitely the lead. So um, glad to start with that. So first, um, thanks for being here. Um, I know so many of you and glad that you were able to join. I think this will be a, a great panel. Um, hopefully many of you have seen some of the new guides. So I'm briefly going to dive into like how we're addressing uh, nature-based solutions at FEMA really quick. And then we're going to dive into like all the cool stuff in our speakers. So FEMA defines nature-based solutions as sustainable planning, design, environmental management, engineering practices that we've uh, natural features or processes into the built environment uh, to promote adaptation and resilience. And so um, we just released a second guide, uh, Solutions for Success. And so um, both of the guides, the first and the second, although nature-based solutions is the term that FEMA has adopted and many other agencies have adopted, um, other organizations use related terms like green infrastructure, natural infrastructure, the Army Corps often use engineering with nature or natural and uh, beneficial features. And so really as a best practice, we just recommend use the term that's gonna resonate best with your target audience. Um, communities can use nature-based solutions to reduce the risk of natural hazards. When designed the right way, uh, nature-based solutions can absorb floodwaters, they can reduce wildfire intensity, uh, you know, lower air temperature and surface uh, temperatures. 
And they also offer social, environmental, and economic benefits for communities uh, that can address many issues uh, through those co-benefits. So leveraging all these benefits uh, in turn improves community resilience. And so I just wanna highlight this like graphic on the right. Uh, this is in the new guide. It's highlighting a number of different nature-based solutions and how you can implement them across various community types. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we've been producing a series on nature-based solutions. We hope to expand that even more. Um, the first guide we have focuses on making the case for nature-based solutions. It talks about the different types uh, from stormwater to green roofs, floodplain restoration, um, heat reduction, um, and so forth. The guide then really dives into how nature-based solutions can be added into local planning and policy efforts and, and some funding strategies through both local and federal opportunities. You may have seen the second guide. So the second guide, Strategies for Success, uh, we wanted to build on the first one by focusing on implementation of nature-based solutions projects. And so the goal is to arm community leaders with information and resources to help them carry out successful projects. Um, I want to be clear, it's not a technical guide. Instead, it focuses on five strategies that are key to implementing any nature-based solutions project. Um, so it overviews each of those strategies and offers tips and resources to help invest in those strategies and includes a number of case studies to see those strategies in action. And that's why we have these amazing guest speakers because we, they have been highlighted for um, really excelling at implementing those strategies to advance nature-based solutions. So what are those five strategies? Those five strategies are building strong partnerships. As many of you know me, um, I, that is something that's super critical. Engaging the whole community, matching your project scale with the desired goals and benefits that you're trying to achieve, maximizing benefits. And as we think about the impact of climate, uh, designing for the future. So uh, to wrap up, the strategies presented in the guide uh, are, are generally in order the, that they would appear in the life of a project. Um, now, there's some that are, are outliers, right? Future conditions is a little bit of an outlier. It comes last um, in the, uh, like later in the guide. But of course, you want to think about that and how climate and population patterns and commu future community development will change over time when you are thinking about and first selecting a nature-based solutions project. Um, and again, as the partnership person, I would be remiss to say, before project planning even begins, you should form partnerships and initiate community engagement that, um, that will, and carry that through project implementation and even after. Um, this will really ensure that the project meets the goals and needs of the whole community. And so, uh, again, these are hopefully we developed another helpful infographic to help illustrate the basic flow of when you can invest in different strategies at different stages uh, throughout the project. Um, so with that, hopefully uh, we'll, uh, you know, we have the QR codes for the guide. We can drop the link to the, the guides and the Nature-Based Solutions uh, website in the chat, but I'll turn it over now to Jay from the Trust for Public Land. So thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Brad, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for taking time to join us today. I am truly honored to share with all of you the recent work that TPL is completed here in Atlanta. Um, but before I dig too much into Cook Park, I'd like to share just a little bit about uh, the Trust for Public Land. Next slide, please. We are a national nonprofit profit focused on connecting everyone to the outdoors. Or in other words, we believe in outside for all. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year of protecting land and providing access to the outdoors. And during that time, our work has been grounded in working on projects that create opportunities for everyone um, to experience the physical and mental health benefits that nature provides. That allows, uh, and in addition, um, it's projects that allow us to work alongside community members or the whole community to create, protect, and advance the outdoor spaces um, that we feel that are essential to everyone's well-being. Uh, next slide. Um, these beliefs shape all the work that we do, whether it's our land conservation work, 
whether it's our trails planning and um, implementation projects um, related to uh, corridors. Um, it, it, it's what allows us to focus on our parks projects and even our schoolyards program. Our schoolyards program is a unique program where we engage students um, at elementary and middle schools to reimagine their school sites so that they can be used as uh, public parks by their, their families after hours. Uh, next slide. So parks like Cook Park provide incredible benefits uh, to a community beyond, beyond just recreational elements. Uh, we believe like many of you that parks can provide multiple climate benefits if designed right. This includes cooling, this includes stormwater management, um, this can even include wild, wildfire protection and most importantly, social connectedness. Next slide. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Cook Park. Um, and the reason that I'm here to talk about Cook Park is, is that it was featured as a case study in the Nature-Based Solutions Guide. Um, for some of you who might be familiar with, with uh, the geography of Atlanta, uh, the Vine City neighborhood sits just outside of downtown Atlanta on the southwest part of town. Uh, the aerial that you see here is a portion of the 16 acre Cook Park site. Uh, this was photographed in 2015. Um, what's important to know is just the history of the neighborhood. Um, from the 1930s until 2002, this part of the Vine City community was a thriving neighborhood with single family and multifamily homes. Um, in for, unfortunately, in 2002 was the uh, site of a horrendous flooding event. It was caused by a tropical depression that was petering out um, from the Gulf, uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, and uh, it was caused by an outdated combined sewer system. Um, so the, the flooding that occurred in this in-town neighborhood um, caused some residents having to be rescued from their living rooms, actually with John boats, um, with six feet of stormwater and sewage um, that had drained into their, their living rooms. It was, it was finally after that event that um, it was realized that this was not a place for folks to live. Um, it, it is a low, was a low topographic point of the city. Um, and it was clear that significant investment needed to be made in the in um, the city's infrastructure system. So fortunately, no lives were lost, but the event displaced 60 families. Um, many of the lives were scarred. Um, and for 13 years, this vacant land was a reminder of the event, an event that could have been avoided. Next slide. To dig a little deeper into the history of the neighborhood, one block west of the Cook Park site is Sunset Avenue. Um, what's unique about Sunset Avenue was that it was truly the center of activism and leadership during the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. This is where um, true icons decided to raise their families. It was on Sunset Avenue is, is where Dr. King raised his family. Uh, it was actually the last home that he lived in. Um, also on Sunset Avenue lived William White, a past chairman of the NAACP and also Julian Bond, Julian Bond helped establish the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, so this, the Vine City neighborhood has, has a rich, rich history of activism and, and community engagement, which made this project that much more important um, and that much more critical uh, to make sure that it was successful. Um, a little bit more detail, Vine City sits adjacent to the campuses of Spelman, Morehouse, Morris Brown, and Clark, Atlanta, uh, where future leaders have been educated and went on to change not just the United States, but the world. But unfortunately, from that time, um, over the past couple of decades, the neighborhood has been plagued by chronic disinvestment, environmental threats, and unfortunately, broken promises. Next slide. Um, in, in 2015, the stars finally aligned with public interest and in some funding to reimagine the 16 acre site as a park, a park with the ability to capture and manage rainwater, um, up to 9 million gallons of water, in fact, and from the 160 acres around the site to alleviate future flooding. Um, it was at that time that TPL was asked to be a part of this project 
um, it was based on our experience shepherding complex projects through to completion in Atlanta, as well as other parts across the country. Um, at that time, TPL entered an MOU with the city of Atlanta. Um, our responsibilities, um, including acquiring outstanding parcels to complete the 16 acre site, um, it included fundraising, it included leading the community engagement for the project um, and managing the project's design and construction. As I mentioned, um, you know, I, Cook Park is an incredible example of engaging the whole community. Um, we were able to achieve this with the passionate residents. Um, you know, not only were they involved with early on participatory design, but they kept the project moving forward. Um, it was with their passion that kept everyone driven on this project, whether it was TPL, whether it was the contractor, whether it was design consultants, to make this project a reality. Um, in addition um, to the, the whole community, um, it's important to know that uh, we would not have been able to do this project without the generous donors that trust, who believe in the work that Trust for Public Land does. So um, Trust for Public Land was responsible for raising $14 million to accompany the city's $26 million investment on this project. So um, following coordinated engineering efforts with the city of Atlanta, we, we finally broke ground and started construction and, and used on-site tours to introduce community stakeholders and financial supporters to our work. Um, in addition to that, that sector of community stakeholders, you know, our, there were certain donors that also wanted to be a little bit more intimately involved with the project. Uh, fortunately, here in Atlanta, we have Delta Airlines. And not only did Delta Airlines contribute a significant amount of money to the project, they asked to be a part of the project's playground installation. And then the, the, the community um, continued to expand as folks caught wind of this project. We were fortunate to engage, a, believe it or not, um, 30 members of the Atlanta climbing community um, who, when they, they volunteered to show youth in the neighborhood the sport of, of climbing. Um, that was a part of an effort to design two outdoor climbing bowlers, actually the first climbing bowlers in the city of Atlanta. Um, and so it was, it was that group and along with so many other groups that, you know, volunteered their weekends to, to make this project is a, a really special place. Uh, next slide. But it, in terms of the whole community, you know, um, fortunately, over the course of the six years that I was a part of the project, I, I got to meet the individuals who comprised that group. And one of those folks who's most special to me is, is Mike Hill. Mike Hill was someone um, who we hired from a local job training program. Um, it was at a time in his life when he was looking for a change and you know, we were able to bring him on site and he was a part of the complete three years of construction. Um, so you know, to work with someone who was raised in the community um, and, and with someone who felt he took away from the community, who's very excited to have a chance to finally give back. Next slide. So, you know, Cook Park, I feel is a testament to how a community can become stronger through collaboration. Um, overall, the project has been seamlessly designed with innovative green infrastructure to reduce flooding um, with sports courts, with a splash pad, with a incredible playground and an outdoor fitness zone, climbing boulders, shaded picnic areas, restrooms, and wide sidewalks to accommodate neighborhood festivals. Next slide. And I believe it's evidence of how a park can be designed with the community and for the community to make a neighborhood more resilient as it responds to urban heat island effect and manages stormwater. It's an incredible example of form uh, truly following function. Next slide. The story of Cook Park is an example of how powerful water can be. It can be destructive as all of you are well aware However, water can also be a foundation for healing and a source for inspiration, a topic for education, a venue for meditation, and a catalyst for environmental restoration. Next slide. Cook Park is also an example of how water can be captured and managed and actually activated for recreation. In Recreation for All, this splash pad was actually the, the top thing that we heard from the community when we went through our community engagement process. N next slide. 
So as I start wrapping up, um, I want to end with the, with the, the story of this woman who I am, believe embodies the work that TPL does and, and probably a lot of the work that each of you do. Um, in September, 2020, I, along with others from our project team had the opportunity, opportunity to tour Cook Park um, with Miss Hood. Um, the park was just wrapping up construction and uh, believe it or not, it was 18 years to the day um, from when she was rec rescued by her grandkids from the water that eventually destroyed her home from that storm that I mentioned earlier. Uh, she shared with us her, her struggles um, that were incurred from that day of the flood and how she persevered to rebuild her life. But what stuck with me from that day was how she was looking forward to spending time in the park once it opened and how she thought Cook Park would provide an opportunity for everyone to learn about the neighborhood's history and its future. Um, certainly everyone deserves to live in a community that is resilient to changing climate conditions and everyone deserves access to nature and the benefits that come with it. And uh, I believe and trust Republic Land believes that the Nature-Based Solutions Guide is an excellent uh, source describing what is possible. Uh, next slide. So um, just to wrap it up here, uh, Cook Park is only one, one example of the types of efforts TPL has been involved with. We have quite a portfolio of analysis tools that we have developed, policy and funding sources that we can identify or even draft, and a number of reports describing innovative programs focused on sustainability. So um, if there's any questions, I know we're gonna have a chance to chat later um, in this um, forum but uh, feel free to reach out to me after this if there's any questions y'all may have. And with that, I would like to hand it off to Rachel Keith. Hi, yeah, thank you. So I wanna give you a very brief overview of one of the projects we have worked on that was highlighted um, uh, by the CERC group and it is called Greenheart Louisville. Um, and so we kind of threw around, I work in an academic institution, and so we threw around this idea of can a greener city mean a healthier you? Um, and we came up with the slogan, greater health by doing good. So we wanted to um, implement a project that would look at using the environment to affect health and so not health of one individual, <clears throat> but health of the community. So what we ultimately had to do was help change the environment and create a place that would benefit um, people's health. And this has a lot to do with exposures and with different um, things that can happen with climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, by the year 2050, it's projected that 2.5 billion more people will live in cities. So these are typical city environments you would see around the world. Um, as you can see, they are not necessarily places or oases of green. Um, there's not a lot of natural space where most of the people are, are centered. And there are a lot of competing uh, built environmental elements that do not uh, benefit health, but instead can actually pose quite a risk to exposures, or um, natural disasters or other elements of climate change that are happening. So our idea was how do we change this environment? Next slide, please. And make it a place where people can thrive and where the community is resilient. And we're not only asking individuals to, to take on that, that, um, that load themselves. So we have one of our partners we partnered with very early on was the Nature Conservancy. And we in academia and in um, some of the more environmentally led groups are starting to really think about trees differently. And trees in urban space in particular have been linked to really good health outcomes. They've been linked to um, promoting nature and biodiversity and creating habitats uh, for other birds, bees, pollinators, bats, things that, that can benefit our health, actually. Um, they increase physical activity, but more importantly, they can really manipulate that environment. And we think that's where some of these health effects and whatnot are coming from. 
So we know that they can manage stormwater. They can help um, pull off some of that, that drainage of that stormwater. They can filter out pollutants. And this could be normal pollutants that you would see every day, like car exhaust, or it could also be occupational um, pollutants. And you know, we can even think farther down the road to looking at um, spills. If these are around certain areas, if there are aer aerosolized um, chemicals that come off these spills, these can help filter and retain those in certain areas. They can also cool the um, city. They have benefits to the community um, as well. So next slide, please. So like any project, we really have to go into the community um, and talk to them about trees and, and their, their, their environment. And we picked an area in Louisville that's a little south of downtown. It's bordered by our airport. And in, um, a few miles even further south is one of our biggest park systems. And this was a neighborhood that had um, been quite prosperous, a middle-class neighborhood for quite a while, um, and had a very good sense of pride of community um, uh, for a very long time. But in the past several years, to decade has kind of changed and uh, been confronted with a lot of different um, problems, including things like tree canopy loss. And this was something that this community identified with. And so by working with the businesses and the people and um, the, the leaders, the policymakers in the city and local nonprofits, we were really able to get an idea of their interest, um, but also help discuss this idea that if we come into your community with trees, we're not trying to do one thing. We're really going to touch on all these different things. Um, we think trees can filter air pollution. We think it can change noise pollution. We think it can change light pollution. We think, um, you know, it can do a lot of things in kind of this one, this one package. Next slide, please. So the other thing we had to understand, though, is because we, we are talking about health effects, we're talking about a community, we're not doing it for one residence. So what do people even think greenness is? So do they understand what we're going to be putting in their spaces? Do they think, similar to what we heard the previous speaker talking about, like, do they think we're coming in and putting in a park? Because that's not, that wasn't our plan. Um, do they think of it as trees or spaces that, that, that their kids can use um, to play sports or that they can use to play sports? And then the spaces we do create, what do people like and want? Because we want this to be um, something that they keep because we want it to um, help generations in the future. We want it to be something that they enjoy and will use as well. So do you have this highly sculptured um, type aesthetic or do you have this wild native aesthetic? And what are the preferences and what are the community benefits? And then what are the, the benefits to the environment of the, the different the different build outs? Because um, they, they both have their pros and cons. So next uh, slide, please. The next thing we did is one of the main things we want to look at is changing stormwater uh, heat and air pollution. So how do we do this? One of the ways that we know contribute to that is all the concrete and highways are a big source of this. So um, we're, the next step was to kind of work with uh, green architects and modeling and um, different groups to look at what designs do we need to put in place? Because we, we're learning more about the design landscape of uh, landscape and that if you put little lollipop trees down a tree, you can actually uh, keep air pollution down closer where people breathe it. So we wanted this to be a true mitigation of some of these environmental changes. And we wanted to study it and actually have a what we call a green print to be able to roll out in different areas you know, around the world even of how we change the environment and what does it do to the environment and what effects can we get from it and what is the best, what is the best way to do that? Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. So not only did we want to change the environment, we wanted to know that we're changing. So we can put all these trees in and people can tell us that, yeah, we like them, but are we manipulating those things that we know affect the community? 
So we do a lot of monitoring. We have mobile monitoring. This is an example of our mobile air monitoring that's in the back of a Prius and they drive around these little blocks and grids and we map everything out. We also have noise monitors, temperature monitors, humidity monitors. So I guess I should call them meteorological monitors, um, light pollution monitors. We're working with um, listening to the sound coming from the airport traffic and how that's mitigated by these trees. So we're, we've developed one of the most robust um, environmental monitoring networks in this small four mile radius in the country to really understand what nature is doing. We also use a wastewater program to look at runoff and, and what's going into our sewer systems. And we can use that for health related or exposure related factors. Um, we're using the people, so people are coming in and we're using them as biomonitors of exposure to see what's happening to the residents, to see how much time they're spending in, in this space and what that does for, for their health. Next slide, please. So um, this is a picture actually at one of our sites. We only we chose to use mainly large plants, um, full size trees. We put in over 8,000 different sources of vegetation. We did a we looked at all the species to understand which ones um, are most likely to filter, which ones are most likely to capture uh, because of the qualities of, of their leaves and whatnot. Um, we wanted to change the green level fast. We didn't want to use small um, plants, but we did have to put some small in to get this, this um, staggering effect of size so that air wouldn't just blow up and over them and that you kind of plugged holes but had enough force to get the, get the air to go through. So there were a lot of factors that went into the selection of um, the plants that we use. And it actually was a quite a long process to that. And then also who can get us and source these plants in time? Um, and then where do we stage them as we, we bring them into the community? Next slide, please. This next slide is actually a example of one of the residential plantings we did. So if you see in the center of that circle, um, in this particular yard, all those evergreens that you can kind of see in the background were installed by us. Um, you can see they're on one of the more minor thoroughways through the area. So we put a row down the roadway to kind of um, help with that water runoff. We're hoping this will help with the, the heat and the light and the noise pollution that comes in, and this will have a filtration effect. So when we could get into people's homes, we really tried to maximize the benefits of the green that we put in. Next slide. And I believe this will be my last slide. So the next slide should be an overview of one of the vegetative buffers we did. So this is the main highway that runs through the area. Um, during peak travel times, it is quite a source of pollution for us. And as you can see in, in this space, there's a sound wall on the left um, of, the, of that tree line. And then on the right is, is the expressway. So we put in this staggered approach to filtration to capture a lot of that um, runoff, to capture a lot of that um, air pollution that's coming in, and also try and help mitigate those heat island effects that we know are centered around concrete and those sort of things. And we did this in certain spaces on the road, and we left certain spaces the, the way they were. And we'll be able to study them hopefully over the next 10 years to learn more and more about how these natural-based um, interventions since there's so many facets that they can help, what are they helping most? How are they helping? And really learn from this project. So I wanna thank you again for inviting us to speak. Um, and I wanna kick it over to Marissa. Hey, thank you, Rachel. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna transition into questions and answers. So Jay, I'm gonna start with you. Um, there were a lot of stakeholders involved in uh, completing the scope of work. How did you identify the technical capability of your scope? Sure. So um, <clears throat> our our main partner on this project was, was the city of Atlanta's Department of Watershed Management, <clears throat> based on the funding they brought to the project. 
And so we knew we had to find a pretty dynamic consultant team in order to take this project on. Yes, Trust for Public Land was responsible for a lot of activities um, in terms of land acquisition and, and community engagement, which I was focused on at the, at the front end. Um, so we actually went through an RFP process and brought on a consultant team who had, been, who had worked on parks of this magnitude. And then when we were ready, um, to bring a contractor on board. Um, fortunately, we had a local contractor, general contractor who had experience working on projects like this. There's a, there's a park similar to Cook Park on the east side of town called Historic Fourth Ward Park. So um, uh, it was kind of a pretty standard construction process bringing the right teams on board. But then I, I think what's most interesting is those local nonprofits that were able to bring their expertise, whether it's tree planting with uh, Trees Atlanta, who we work a lot with, um, a group called the Path Foundation, actually, who uh, builds paths and, and trails. And so um, there was another, a number of other nonprofits that we were able to engage. And unfortunately, to have quite a, a quite a established uh, stable of, of just really great folks to, to collaborate with. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, Rachel, you you also had several stakeholders participating in creating the scope of work. How did you identify the the technical capability of your scope? Right. So I think our scope, um, we kind of broke it down into pieces because there's parts that have to do with the greening intervention, there's parts that have to do with the health study, there's design factors, there's the implementation science a portion. So we really were in charge of the science and the health side, which was funded by NIH actually, but they said, no, we don't fund trees. <laughs> so we had to find people who knew about trees. And then through those people, we had to talk about who can do the design and the modeling to figure out what the designs mean. And then once we had the modeling, we had to go back and say, what vendors can we talk to about species and availability and getting these large, you know, we don't have a lot of vendors that can put in the huge, huge trees and where do they come from? So we kind of broke it down into pieces and parts and really focused on finding people with expertise in those areas and um, people who were willing to work as part of a dynamic multidisciplinary team. And it did really take um, our city government as well, because we had to go through permitting and processing to be on the right of ways. And we had to have, um, you know, we had to have information from them. So it cannot be understated what project management is needed to coordinate all those different interests. And for us, at least, also all the different backgrounds, because coming from an academic setting is very different from a city setting from a, a for-profit company. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of coordination had to, had to go on. Um, Rachel, you mentioned monitoring requirements. Um, what, what product were you, um, would you hope to get out of the long-term monitoring requirements uh, of your scope? Yeah, so, you know, believe it or not, we have monitored, because we're academics, we want to learn from every little thing we do. We've monitored this project just about every way you can. You know, we've monitored what's went well, where there's sticking points, you know, how can we address the sticking points? But I think our ultimate goal is to be a project that can understand what nature does in these sort of urban environments and learn all the different implications that can be applied to, right? So for us, Yes, we're looking at, at, at buffering air pollution and stormwater and, and um, you know, and, and uh, the heat effects, but how do we apply that to other places? Like what happens next? Like this can't, this is great for this four mile area, but what happens next? So we want to create what we call that green print that we can share with people and say, these type of trees do this, this density does that. If you have these sort of changes, it does that. This is what it can pull out of the environment. This is what it can put in and really create a green print to use nature to build a resilient community. Because I think a lot of times people are asked to do it themselves. And you know we don't always have the resources or the knowledge to do that. So this is for community level you know, action. Yeah, that's great and and very much needed. Uh, Jay, on your project, is there a monitoring or a research requirement? 
Sure. Um, from what I understand, so I, I know the Department of Watershed Management is monitoring um, the investment that they made with the green infrastructure out there. I can't speak real. I can't speak to it because um, I don't know exactly everything that they're they're um, keeping their eye on. Um, I also know that Georgia Tech um, is doing some urban heat island effect uh, research. Uh, fortunately, they picked up a, a, a bunch of data for the neighborhood prior to the construction of Cook Park, and I understand they're out there right now. So that, that's only monitor, monitoring that I'm aware of. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, hey, Jay, one of, the, one of the major hurdles in executing a nature-based solution project is finding the funding. Uh, for them. Um, can you describe what funding sources you used and was it easy or difficult to attain? <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, and this responds to your original uh, question, Marissa. I mean, our scope was defined by two things. One was the fact that we knew that we had to be able to be able to uh, manage 9 million gallons of stormwater. Okay because we knew we were going to be collecting stormwater from 160 acres around the site. The second scope item um, in terms of, or the second aspect that defined our scope is what we heard from the community. I mean, we had, fortunately, we had 16 acres to play with, but there was a need for um, recreational elements in the area. So that, um, those two lenses, I, I guess, by which we shaped the project uh, allowed us to pursue the, Nash, the, the, the funding, okay? So uh, Department of Watershed Management had $26 million set aside for this project. Um, their investment went into significant utility relocation. It included remediation. Um, about a third of the site had contaminated soil on it. Um, and then obviously all the green infrastructure and other stormwater management components. From a TPL perspective, when we, when we fundraised for our $14 million, uh, fortunately here in Atlanta, uh, we've, we've got a number of Fortune 500 companies who already are familiar with Trust Republic Land and what we've accomplished here. Um, they were the first ones we reached out to to see if they'd be willing to um, invest in this project. Um, and so once those names and those folks uh, you know, helped fund this project, other groups also came on board because Trust for Public Land has a national presence, you know, we were able to step outside of Atlanta and, you know, get funding from North Face and get funding from Walmart and, you know, VF Corporation and all these other groups. So I can tell you it was far from easy, um, you know, raising the $14 million, but we're, we're happy we, we got to that point and uh, folks were, uh, you know, blown away um, when they have visited the, the site in the neighborhood to see what their funding went into. Now it's a great project. That's a, that's a lot of work to uh, to get the funding. You know, Rachel, I'm going to ask you the same question. I understand your project uh, included like piecemealing your funding sources together. Um, would you would you speak to your funding sources? And and yeah. again, was it easy or difficult to attain? It was hard. I mean, it took us three to five years of lead up. Um, to even be able to get to the point where we were doing, you know, enough fundraising to execute the project. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, we pieced together the, the health piece through NIH because um, we could pose that as a study. We can change people's health. We can study it. That's something they fund. Um, it's harder to find funding for green spaces. So we went to organizations who do that sort of thing, like the Nature Conservancy. And the Nature Conservancy was actually in charge and took on that scope of work for us to, to raise the funds. And, you know, they are a philanthropic organization. We also had local philanthropic um, donors. We have UPS that is has a major hub here. So we worked with them. They actually put trees in the ground, but then we also went to community places, you know, and say, hey, can we use your space in your church gym or in your local government community center or your Americana outreach center for our health studies to, you know, or to put in local gardens, can we put these plants there with a community garden that we, we use some space from. So it was really piecing together all the resources we could because, you know, this is kind of new and no, it's not a park, it's not a this, you know, um, so it took a lot of different players to make it happen. 
Yeah, you know, Rachel, while we're on the, the topic, uh, do you mind speaking to what the timeline was to receiving the funds to construction completion? Right. So um, it took us about two to five years of prep work, um, you know, and this was commitments from people to start the work kind of under other scopes or under other commitments um, and just a commitment to the project. And then once it started, we um, we did two years of health visits in the community and community outreach and mo air monitoring and environmental monitoring, all the while fundraising. Um, and so then we hit pandemic um, and it gave us a little more time to get money in, but we also weren't able to put trees in, in the ground. Once we put trees in the ground, it really took us about a year from that point. And I would say we were fundraising the entire scope of that. So I would say there was at least five to eight years of fundraising to get to this point. And we're still fundraising and still looking for funding sources to continue this project. And we have people getting biodiversity grants and getting you know little, little other supplements to look at different pieces. And, and we've really tried to create a living laboratory that other people can use. Wow, that is a, that's a lot of work. Um, you know, Jay, I understand your project required uh, environmental cleanup work. Um, what was the timeline for you from receiving the funding to construction completion? Sure. So um, our MOU with the city of Atlanta was executed in January of 2016. Um, so it was at that time that we started land acquisition, fundraising, community engagement, um, and through that, until we had our ribbon cutting, I, I think, what, it was um, six and a half years had gone by. And, and, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a year and a half of, uh, we had a year of remediation that had to take place on site. And even with all the testing that take, took place in this urban environment, um, there were some cases where we actually had to chase some of this contaminated soil. So once we had thought we had tackled it, you know, we found some more, we found some more, we found some more. Um, so that was uh, obviously um, not something that we planned for up front. Um, but then they also things, other things we didn't plan for was just the amount of rain that we received in the city of Atlanta during construction. And the park was under construction for two years. Um, we did not expect it to be longer than, 15 months, but we had actually received more rain than we had ever received ever in the history of the city. So um, the positive spin to that is the fact that we got to see the park in action while it was under construction. However, it did slow construction down considerably. Uh, from a permitting perspective, um, you know, just like any other construction project, it did require going through a, the city of Atlanta's permitting process, but this was a high priority project for everyone involved. And so we were able to get through that pretty quickly. Oh, that's amazing. Um, you know, Jay, I'm wondering, was there any pushback um, on executing your project? And if there was, would how did you manage it? Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, there was pushback from the, from the very beginning. Um, this was a neighborhood that's been promised many things over the years with very few items delivered upon. Um, and so for a neighborhood, that had gone through what I understand 16 different planning studies since 1994, you know, for them to hear from another group like the Trust for Public Land that, hey, we're gonna build a park. They're like, okay, we'll believe it when we see it. And so we were able to earn the trust of the residents and the community by frankly not going away. I, I mean, and it was much more than just attending the neighborhood meetings. It was a lot of coffee and sweet tea on front porches to foster relationships with these um, with these folks. Um, and you know, fortunately uh, for me, there's there were friendships made that I never thought I would have, um, just based on um, those um, relationships that you know I I we had a chance to create over the course of this project. So. Um, in terms of, you know, I, I, I looked at page five, I think on the nature based solutions guide where it shows kind of a flow chart and how there's community engagement task, community engagement task, community engagement. I mean, that's the whole thing. Community engagement is going all the way through from the beginning of the project to the very end. And fortunately, I can carry through with that now, but I, I don't call it community engagement. I just call it meeting up with old friends. 
Well, that's a good end state uh, for that. Uh, Ra Rachel, I have the same question to you. Did, did you have any pushback on, on your project? And, and if you did, you know, how did you manage it? Yeah, so I think we got pushed back, of course. <laughs> People don't always want trees, right? They don't want to deal with the leaves. They don't know who's going to do maintenance. They don't know who's going to water them, what happens if they fall down. So I think to me, and then also on the permitting side, we had to go back and forth with the state because they're like, oh, you're going to obstruct the view shed. You have to change the design. Oh, your roots are going to cause this issue. You got to change the design. You can't, we have certain policies around trees that can't be over a certain height. You have to change the design. So I think really, because I know we're, we're starting to get closer to the end of, of the hour, I think it's bi-directional communication, right? Like us as academics or us as the people who are coming in to do something, think we have a really good idea. And it, by all accounts, we probably do, but listening to the voice and the opinion of the people who are in the community, because this is their home and they feel like they have a vested stake. So we had the most pushback when people thought they were experts in an area such as landscaping or something like that and didn't feel as engaged as they wanted to be in the project because they thought there was insight that we weren't able to, to, to get from them that could be very helpful. So when we can reach out and establish that connection and have those discussions and, and, it, and then feel like they're, they're, they're part of the project, it, it really helps overcome a lot of the, you know, the questions and the concerns about the project. Yep, that sounds, it sounds like a lot of work, but it sounds like um, you've probably made a pretty good partnership for a continued effort. So, um, well, that wraps up um, the direct questions. So um, I think we have time for questions from the participants. Um, Rachel, this one's for you. Um, interested in knowing more of how you evaluated for plantings, not only from an airflow and filtering capability, but did you also consider potential plants from an allergen perspective? The answer is yes, for and in multiple different ways, right? So the sex of the, the tree or the plant is considered because pollen is usually generated by one or, the, you know, like you have worse sources or worse allergens are associated with the different sexes of the plants. Um, also, some plants, you know, are considered more allergenic than others. So those are all taken into consideration. And then the monitoring we can do will also pick up some of those, those um, components of pollen and, and, and allergens. And then on top of it, we can look at the, the people. So we, have, we are following over a thousand people in the community, but we can also look at hospital records. We have a sub-study on asthma and allergens and kids in the area. So we are doing a lot of things in the environment and then also in the community residents to understand that. Amazing. Uh, Jay, this one's for you. Uh, well, could go to both of you, but I'm directing it to Jay. What were the conversations about maintenance like? Did you have to get community leaders plus the people who would need to provide ongoing care to buy in? Your question was about maintenance. Um, so, um, yeah, we learned um, there was tremendous research um, over the course of the design of the project where we were picking up the best practices from the other parks across the city of Atlanta, um, not just from a design perspective, but obviously for maintenance. And so um, we, we've designed a park um, that is fairly low maintenance. However, the pond and the other green infrastructure does require a little bit more care um, and that's managed by the Department of Watershed Management. They knew what they were getting into with this project. Um, and so the park does get a lot of love. Um, <laughs> in fact, there's, there's many more people out there than I ever could have imagined, which is awesome. But, um, you know, the city of Atlanta has, you know, made this project a priority. So when it comes to having an extra crew out there picking up litter, stuff like that, then um, you know, that's that's part of their scope of work. So we we did our very best to to work with the city of Atlanta to understand what their expectations were, obviously, but you know, like I said before, learn from their best practices. So yeah, maintenance was key. And I and you know, I, I would encourage anyone um, 
who's designing a public space like this, that is that has to be a very early conversation. It needs to be something that shapes your scope of work. You know, you don't want to get too far down the line and say, oh my gosh, this is going to take a lot of work by somebody who's going to do it. And how much is it going to cost? Absolutely. If you can't maintain it, then it's not going to function properly. You know, Rachel, I think that's relevant for you as well. Do, do you, did you have yeah. conversations about maintenance? Yeah, so we had a conversation on multiple levels. You know, some of the early community groups we held, we got cussed out about more, you know, trees and limbs and cracking sidewalks, um, you know. And so we had to have a conversation with the residents who were going to be living in the area with the policymakers because those policymakers and local council people aren't going to be voted in if the residents don't like the policies and things they're putting into place with the city. Um, with the people who may be implementing the maintenance. So it was multi-layer and it is still ongoing because there are some people who didn't think they're being watered enough or didn't, you know, didn't, like they saw dead trees and they didn't think they came out early enough. So it is a constant thing. And I will tell you part of that funding we sought is a pot that is set aside just for maintenance for a certain period of time. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I'm gonna, this is the last question, um, and I think I'm going to direct this one to, to Bradley Dean. Um, how do nature-based solutions link to the implementation of the National Flood Insurance Program beyond stormwater management? Yeah, I, th I thought I was off the hook for the rest of this, nope. but, uh, but nope. thanks for that question. Um, you know, there's, there's two big pieces. Like, obviously, nature-based solutions are, are very good risk like you know flood risk reduction activities like that's one of that's the, realistically that's the primary reason we at FEMA are promoting them at least through our efforts in the risk management program um there's another really big one so um so yes admittedly the, the greatest linkage is stormwater management water quantity reduction like risk reduction benefits so flood risk reduction benefits um there is another linkage, however, and that is to the community rating system, which actually is going through kind of like an update. So if you're not familiar with the community rating system, it's basically mitigative efforts that can be done at the community level and applied and, and you know, based on your grade, the more things you do to mitigate your flood risk, the, the lower your grade and the greater discount you get on your national flood insurance program, like flood insurance, and that's a community-wide benefit. Um, the biggest number, the biggest value that you can get for points in the community rating system is for open space preservation. By far and away, the absolute best thing a community can do to reduce community-wide um, premiums. And so uh, that's not just the only thing where nature-based solutions apply. There's things like floodplain restoration and so forth, but it really, most of it falls under that um, open space preservation. So if you're not familiar with the community rating system, um, you know, take a look at that. It's a great linkage. I know there's probably going to be some, some additional uh, pieces to the nature-based solutions uh, discussion uh, for a community rating system as it kind of evolves, but that's the big one. Thanks so much, Bradley. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panel for sharing your experience and your expertise with us today and for your commitment to bringing these nature-based solutions to life. So as we wrap up, the last step that I have for you attendees is that final requirement to qualify for the ASF PM continuing, ed continuing education credit. If you want that credit and you answered that required poll at the beginning of the webinar, you just need to use the chat function and you can chat it to everyone or if you want it to be private, you can just chat it to host and panelists or just chat it to me, Leah O'Neill host. Just send us your name, your email address, and your state. And that will ensure that along with you completing that poll earlier in the presentation will ensure that, that you get that ASFPM continuing education credit. So that concludes today's webinar. We'll let you know when this recording is available. Thank you so much for joining us. Everybody have a great afternoon. And we'll